our next panel is called The Law of Democracy. Um, North Carolina, as we all know, is no stranger to uh, lawsuits concerning how we elect people or how we vote, uh, the, the laws that govern our, our democratic system. Um, and so we have some great panelists here today, um, but I first want to introduce our moderator, the Honorable uh, Jim Dever. Uh, Mr., uh, judge Dever serves as the U.S. District Court Judge um, for the Eastern District of North Carolina. He's been in that role since he was appointed by President Bush uh, in 2002. He served as Chief Judge of the Court from 2011 to 2018. Um, and of course, looking at his resume, it's not hard to put together a pretty impressive list of accomplishments. Um, you know, Notre Dame undergrad on an ROTC uh, scholarship, graduated with high honors, went to Duke Law School, was the editor-in-chief of the Law Review, or the, excuse me, the Duke Law Journal there, clerked on the Ninth Circuit, then went on to serve uh, in the Pentagon for four years, uh, working for the Secretary of the Air Force there. Uh, he then moved back to North Carolina, was in private practice um, before joining the bench. So please um, join me in welcoming Judge Dever. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for that very kind uh, introduction. It's uh, certainly my privilege to be here. Uh, and I also want to echo the praise for, for Ashley and, and everyone that, that, that organized this event. Um, I will date myself a little bit, but I can remember going to FedSoc meetings in North, I told Gene this, in, in, in the early and mid-90s in the Triangle um, that we could have held in a phone booth. Um, the young people here need to look that up on Google, what a phone booth actually is. Um, but I think Frank may have been at the meeting and then, then Paul Newby before he was the Chief Justice, but it really is extraordinary. Uh, to be able to gather here uh, today to, uh, to have the discussions that uh, are the hallmark of uh, FedSoc events. Uh, and it's my privilege uh, to be able to um, be the moderator of this, uh, of this pa uh, panel on this very uh, important topic uh, and just where we're gonna uh, potentially discuss a wide range of issues associated with um, elections, including uh, redistricting and the election clause and, and uh, racial gerrymandering and partisan gerrymandering, the Voting Rights Act, where it is, where it's going, um, uh, voter ID, the legitimacy of legislatures, um, COVID restrictions. I mean, there's just countless uh, topics that we can talk about um, associated with this, and we have this extraordinary panel. It's my privilege uh, to introduce. Uh, we'll go in the order here. Uh, Phil Strack is a partner at Nelson Mullins, um, Campbell undergrad, Carolina Law. I've known Phil since he was an associate at Maupin Taylor and Ellis, where I used to practice. Um, and Phil has, has been literally at the epicenter of so many of these um, uh, cases uh, over the last 20 years. Um, and continues to be at the epicenter, not only in North Carolina, but has uh, not only a, a robust employment practice, but a robust national election law practice. Um, uh, we have uh, Rick Glazier, who is, uh, to, to sort of use the words of Teddy Roosevelt, has been a man in the arena in North Carolina in, in public service in so many different capacities, a seven-term legislator uh, in the North Carolina legislature, um, a school board service, service as a, as a practicing attorney, and now uh, the, the uh, executive uh, director of the North Carolina Justice Center where he supervises a lot of lawyers and gets to use all of that experience. Um, and, and then we have um, uh, Professor Derek Muller, who is a chaired professor at the University of Iowa School of Law, uh, Hillsdale undergrad, University of Notre Dame Law School, taught for a number of years at Pepperdine Law School before uh, joining uh, the faculty at the University of Iowa, and uh, a nationally recognized election law scholar, uh, as well as, uh, as one who's a scholar in, in, in uh, connection with federal courts. So a terrific uh, panel. Uh, the way we're, we've talked about doing this, I'm going to sort of give each uh, of our panelists uh, some five to eight minutes to, to make some introductory remarks. And then I, I suspect that what we'll end up having is just a conversation among the three. I'm going to do my best to stay out of the way. If there is happens to be a lull in the conversation, um, I will bring up another topic, but I really don't foresee that uh, given the, the variety of topics uh, with two uh, folks 
who've really been on the ground here in North Carolina, and then uh, Professor Muller, who has a, a very national perspective uh, on the topic. Uh, so uh, there, again, as with the last panel, if you have questions, uh, there are note cards on the table, and um, they will end up getting to Andrew. Um, and at the, sort of the last part of the talk, we'll, uh, we'll t try and take some of those questions. So with that, it's my privilege to uh, turn it over to Phil. All right. Thank you, Judge Dever. Um, uh, Phil Strack, I, I've been uh, practicing uh, election law, employment law, and, and doing this election law stuff for over 20 years. And it goes back to uh, 2001 when I had the privilege of working on a case uh, uh, that became a landmark case known as Stevenson v. Bartlett. And that was when Judge Dever was just Jim Dever to me at that time. <laughs> Uh, but I was what the paralegal would call a baby lawyer uh, at the time, the associate um, who got to go over to the School of Government and research everything about county government uh, in North Carolina. But the, the neat thing about that case was it was premised on a very specific provision in the North Carolina Constitution. It was not, it was not premised on, on uh, you know, one of the, the Holy Grail type provisions that uh, Professor Markman uh, spoke about earlier. It, it, it's a provision that says no county shall be divided in the formation of House and Senate districts. And the legislature had basically ignored that and sort of written it out of the Constitution for two decades. And so the lawsuit was meant to enforce that. And that's what the court did. They said, yes, you, you have to respect that. And there's a particular way you have to respect that um, consistent with federal law. So you can do both. You can comply with this provision. You can comply with federal law. Uh, and that decision, the state law part of that, was uh, reaffirmed years later in 2014 in, in a case called Dixon v. Rucho, which we also, uh, which I handled uh, last decade. Um, I've done a bunch of election recounts. Uh, my, my first big one was in 2002. I handled the recount for Lewis Pate, who was a Republican candidate who was running against Phil Bedore. And what was interesting, there's two things interesting about that recount. Number one was that that the winner of that recount was gonna determine the control of the General Assembly. That's how tight it was uh, that year. Uh, and uh, then Representative Pate won, so I came out on the, the winning side of that, thankfully. Uh, but I also met my current wife uh, in that uh, recount. We followed each other around the Wayne County Courthouse for two days uh, while people count, hand counted ballots, so that was pretty cool. The thing about recounts, though, that I've always found uh, interesting is that recounts do kind of reaffirm mostly that we have a pretty good system in North Carolina, uh, election system, really no matter who's running it, because recounts rarely over, overturn election results from election night. And they often confirm uh, the, however many votes there were between two candidates, it, it often confirms that. And so I, I tell people that, you know, uh, recounts are kind of a, a sort of an audit almost that you get to do occasionally and I think it's kind of reaffirmed how how good our system um, works but it also reaffirms for me the fact that every vote counts uh, and uh, making sure every vote is legal is very very important uh, in this state uh, so I've handled other some statewide some congressional recounts um, and but the last 10 years or so what i've been primarily focused on is redistricting uh and that's the thing that's gotten uh the most attention uh there's been an explosion in those cases it used to be that there'd be a case or two at the beginning of the decade and then it would just go away and you would forget everything you'd learned by the time the next cycle rolled around that's not the case anymore um so last last decade we handled dixon v rucho which reaffirmed uh, Stevenson v. Bartlett and how you uh, draw uh, House and Senate districts in uh, North Carolina. Uh, Cooper v. Harris, which was about the congressional districts. The federal court threw those districts out as racial gerrymanders. Um, and they were then redrawn. Um, and it's the same in a case called Covington as to legislative districts. Although what was pretty interesting about both those, and somebody was talking about, you know, you have the, you have the case, the liability phase, but then the remedy, uh, in both those cases, uh, the districts were redrawn, but the political results remain very similar, even though courts had redrawn parts of those or the legislature had redrawn um, parts of those. 
then the big case last decade was Common Cause versus Rucho. I had the honor of being the lead trial uh, counsel uh, for the legislature in that case. And that's when the U.S. Supreme Court finally decided it had had enough of this stuff. Uh, and it was going to wash its hands of partisan gerrymandering claims and held that they were not justiciable, which they had been arguing about for 40 or 50 years. And that, of course, then prompted uh, the attention on the state courts. And so the next year, uh, a, a case was filed called Common Cause v. Lewis, which was a state court, state law, partisan gerrymandering claim. Uh, again, uh, the, the, the defendants lost. We lost in the trial court. Uh, we did not take appeal. We drew, uh, appeal. We drew the districts, and that was, uh, many of you may remember, when the lottery machine was used uh, to draw certain lottery balls to pick which maps would go into effect. So it was about as random a process as you could get. That was what we did in the remedial phase. And the political results, once again, not that much different than they had been um, before. This decade, the... Uh, the, the, it, it's been the same. Uh, so I've been personally litigating. Uh, we've had, obviously, there's a case going on in North Carolina, which is on appeal. Uh, and we have an argument uh, probably next month. So that's all I'll say about that one. And then we've, uh, uh, Ohio has had a bunch of litigation uh, regarding their congressional map and their legislative map. Those cases are interesting because they involve uh, reforms that were passed by the voters the last decade creating a new process uh, for how to draw the districts, creating a new commission which has a role uh, in certain respects uh, in those districts, and then creating a new way to litigate those. And in those cases in Ohio, the case starts and end with, ends with the Ohio Supreme Court, uh, which is was new to me. And uh, it's not a way I recommend anybody who's reform-minded uh, doing it, because you can't develop much of a trial record uh, when the state Supreme Court is the one litigating uh, the case um, but those that Ohio has been interesting because we've had uh, five different legislative maps. They've all been struck down. So a federal court had to come in through what's called impasse litigation and pick one of the maps uh, to impose on the state so that the state could have elections. And uh, I think that surprised a lot of the folks in Ohio. Uh, but in Ohio, as in North Carolina, the, the, fun, the right to vote trumps everything else. And so if a federal court has to come in and pick a map, they have the right and the duty to come in and pick a map, and that's what they did. Uh, and the Ohio's also holding congressional elections this year under maps that were thrown out, but it was too late uh, to do anything. And part of the reason is because the reforms that were passed in Ohio did not, they, they gave the Ohio Supreme Court a lot of power, but they specifically denied the court the power to redraw districts. So it's literally just a game of whack-a-mole. So we draw a map, we hand it to the court, court strikes it down, we draw another map, we hand it to the court, court strikes it down, and you just go like that ad nauseum uh, until, until a federal court, as it turns out, has to step in. So um, that's what's been going on there. And then in Louisiana, we've been litigating Voting Rights Act claims, Section 2 claims under the Voting Rights Act, where the, where the claim has been that uh, the the legislature should have created an additional majority minority uh, district in Congress and several more in the legislative maps. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court stayed the congressional case and, and granted certiorari before judgment and held, is holding the case in abeyance pending uh, a case out of Alabama, which is a carbon copy of our Louisiana case. Uh, and then the district judge stayed the legislative case because she saw the handwriting on the wall with the congressional stay and decided to, to put her pen down until she sees what the U.S. Supreme Court's going to do. And so on redistricting, I just, I'm just going to throw a few thoughts out there and see if how many folks disagree with me uh, this afternoon and try not to get in too much trouble. Um, in terms of where I see things going, on, on Voting Rights Act claims, it's interesting because last decade, um, the legislatures were being sued first on racial gerrymandering theories. Uh, and of course, racial gerrymandering claims are very distinct from vote dilution claims under Section 2. Uh, and so um, this time around, though, the cases are starting out as Section 2 vote dilution claims. So it's a, it's a, it's a switch change of strategy. Um, but 
th that decision to do that produced this case out of Alabama called the Merrill case. And the U.S. Supreme Court's going to hear that case this term and decide it. And uh, I think what you're going to see the court do with that case is hopefully start to develop some uh, clearer barrier or, or lines between when you have to use race under Section 2 when it's justified versus when you're engaging in racial gerrymandering. Because uh, the, the jurisprudence on that question is very murky. Uh, it's, it's only good for lawyers right now uh, because we litigate it uh, every decade. And so I think you'll see the court start to try to draw some, um, some brighter lines. And I think they'll also um, really, uh, I think they'll probably come out with an opinion that will, will make it easier to not use race and to do race blind uh, redistricting in certain states, uh, which is something we've done in North Carolina, something we did in Ohio. Uh, and so I think you'll see the court facilitate that uh, it's more race neutral trying to take that out unless it's extremely justified under certain circumstances. On partisan gerrymandering claims, this involves the, 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 the so-called independent state legislature doctrine that you all have been reading about, that everyone's been going crazy about. Uh, I think it's all overblown. Um, I, the, 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 the calling it the independent state legislature doctrine is, to me, it's a misnomer. Uh, it's just a sort of a made up name. It's really just, it's, just, it's the elections clause of the US Constitution. It's just a clause, it's just constitutional text. And the court's being asked to enforce the actual text of the Constitution, which says that time, place, and manner regulations on federal elections belongs to the state legislature. Not the state, not the courts, not, not any other entity, they're just being asked to, to decide that. There's a case pending out of North Carolina on that right now. Um, and there may be other cases pending on that before it's all said and done. And, you know, what I, one thing when, when I talk to groups like this, I like to emphasize is, you know, not everything is going to destroy democracy. Uh, the so-called independent state legislature doctrine is not going to destroy democracy. The, the, the country's not going to end based on what the U.S. Supreme Court does with that case. Uh, and I think, I think in, in many respects, we've got to tone the rhetoric down. Uh, because the country is more polarized than ever. And I think continuing to, to um, talk about things in terms of destruction and it's, it's going to be over and, you know, the country's done and all this, I, I just think that's not helpful. I think we have to start talking about it in more rational ways. But then more specifically on that case, the Morvey Harper case that's pending, um, it's only asking the court to they're only asking the court to say that the state courts don't have a role in congressional redistricting. A lot of people are speculating that, oh, the court's gonna come down and say that uh, there's no review of the legislature for election laws at all. Uh, and that's not, that's not the issue in the case. That may be something that comes down the pike down, down the road, but that's not the case now. And so I think when you hear people talk about these cases, I think it's important to understand what they're actually about. Uh, and what they're what they're not in, about, and then finally, uh, in terms of just general election administration, we all saw what happened with COVID. Uh, we saw uh, admi you know administrative agencies essentially rewriting statutes. Um, we saw courts uh, through uh, what I would call sort of sue and settle schemes changing the law uh, based on a lawsuit that had really no defense. Um, and so I think you're going to see more of an effort this cycle, uh, this year, uh, to countermand that uh, and to make sure that the, the bureaucracy, the administrative agencies are following the law uh, as written. Um, and I think you'll see uh, legal efforts you know, here and in other states to, um, to address that. Thank you, Phil. Rick? Well, Judge Dever and uh, fellow panelists, it's an honor for you, for me to be here with you. Um, I'm going to open with some personal remarks and then move into a little bit of the conversation, Phil, uh, as eloquently, and you can see why he's a national expert in election law, uh, talked about. 
Um, I, I am not an election law expert. I uh, probably have some expertise in running for elections, um, uh, practical implications, uh, but the two gentlemen to my right and left are, and it's very nice to actually be in the center, um, uh, so uh, I can talk more about it. But I began my legal career as a public defender out of when I graduated from Wake Forest Law School in Cumberland County, and I was there for about a year and a half um, when a man was nominated from Wilmington to be a United States District Court judge, Jim, uh, James Fox. And I had some colleagues who were clerking at the time in the Eastern District of North Carolina and suggested that I apply. And I did, and, and much to my surprise, was selected by Judge Fox as a law clerk. I ended up clerking for the judge for three years, uh, in part because we tried a 97-day non-jury trial over two years. And he didn't want to switch law clerks in the middle of about a 500-page opinion. Um, so I, I became very close to him, but six months into the clerkship uh, with this Reagan-nominated um, district court judge hiring a fairly progressive Democrat uh, law clerk, I, I, I asked him why. And he said, Rick, I hired you because I wanted someone to test my assumptions. I have enough people around me telling me what I want to hear. I want to know if I'm right. I want to know other things. And, he, and, and that's the role that I played. Uh, truth be told, I think we only disagreed one time in my three years of clerkship. Um, and, and he taught me something else, which I carried uh, professionally, because I thought that was um, the way I wanted to do the rest of my professional career. Always hire people around you uh, who you think are smarter than you and who will test your assumptions. But secondly, he said, civility breeds civility, and incivility breeds incivility in everything you do. And in the practice of law, it is no different. And in my view, uh, in the practice of public life, it's no different. Um, so I, I, I start with that background. Um, and I, I've spent my career trying to follow the lead of Jim Fox and how I've handled myself. Um, I was very lucky in another portion of my career to be elected to the State House of Representatives, as Judge Dever said. I, I was particularly lucky in a lot of ways. The year I was elected, which Phil actually talked about, uh, was 2002, when the legislature in the only time in North Carolina's history was split 60-60, um, which meant for 2003 and 2004, every vote mattered, every opinion mattered, and you had to care about what colleagues on the right and the left and the middle said, and the goal was, in many, many cases, to find consensus. And I learned several things from that experiment, uh, that, that, that two years. First, um, uh, in my 16 elections, uh, which I, I'm very proud to have won with lots of help by lots of people, um, I never ran a single negative ad in any campaign against my opponent, even naming my opponent. I wanted people to vote for me for what I stood for and what I did and what my votes were and who I was about. And if that wasn't good enough, I was a temporary occupant of the job. Um, and my job was to do my job in an intelligent and informed and thoughtful manner because people elected me to exercise my best judgment. And that led me to an understanding that if I was able to get on the bills that I wanted enacted, including voting rights bills, 60% of what I wanted but with a unanimous vote, it beat the hell out of a 61-59 vote trying to get 100% of what I wanted, which would never be settled and would whipsaw the public based on elections. Um, and that really can't serve democracy or the institutions very well. Unfortunately, over the last two decades, I think we've seen a lot of whipsaw elections uh, with one party not learning from the other party um, uh, to move in increments, to move in ways that the people come along with you. Um, in my 13 and a half years in the legislature, uh, I was privileged enough uh, to be a part of 500 bills where I was a prime sponsor, one of the four lead sponsors that were enacted into law. Um, not a single bill that I ever had passed failed to have at least one Republican co-sponsor, prime sponsor, or vote. Uh, and I view that as the way legislators ought to operate because it means you're trying to find consensus and to solve people's problems, not to create them. I find, and I'm saddened, and I agree with so much of what Phil said, uh, it has really saddened me to, be, uh, to see the institutions being tugged apart by a deeply polarized nation. 
And frankly, no area more polarized than election law um, in, in many of the states. Witness Wisconsin right now on the one side and New York on the other. Um, I, I think that, and I hope that, um, an example I'm gonna give you, and then I'll turn to the two cases that Phil talked about and, 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 and turn it over to, to a much smarter person than I on the law of those cases, um, is an example. For many years, um, including my first date in the legislature and part of my next two, um, there was a real bipartisan effort to expand voter access and ability in this state and understanding that this idea of uh, coming out of the agrarian society that we had one election day and it was from you know seven in the morning till seven in the evening and everybody of course could vote on that day or you'd use an absentee ballot wasn't the way to gain full access for everybody. And so there were a number of initiatives passed, including early voting, including uh, voter drives for younger than 18-year-olds uh, in high schools, including same-day registration, uh, including better access to facilities for disabled voters. All of that, most of all of that, was done in a bipartisan way with the opportunity there. After the 2010 election, there was an issue that cropped up in this state because we have a high military population. I represented Fort Bragg. It was part of it in my district. But I also understood that a lot of military personnel vote absentee. And the question was whether to lessen the restrictions on absentee voting, lessen the requirements, make it less onerous for military to vote. Um, and my uh, seatmate behind me, uh, Democrat Greer Martin, who served in Iraq and still serves in uh, the reserve, uh, got along with Rick Killian on the Republican side, and I fail to remember at my old age who the other Republican uh, representative was, and said, would you sign a bill that removed some of those restrictions and allowed easier access for the military to vote? Well, I had just won one of my elections by 44 votes. Um, uh, winning on election night by 20 uh, and then picking up votes provisionally and uh, losing some votes in absentee. And I had known that throughout my history that the absentee vote favored the Republican candidates in my district, it still does, uh, my former district. And I had to think about it. And I told them I need overnight to consider this. We all think about how a bill might affect us and particularly in the election cycle. And then I got to thinking, if I stay true to my principles, it's not my seat, it's the people's seat. And the people in my district include those soldiers. Um, and I signed that bill at Greer's urging. I, I'm not the, the, the hero in the story, Greer really is, because he persuaded me that that was the right thing to do. Now, if that bill had been in effect when I ran in 2010, I would have lost that election based on the absentee vote numbers alone. Um, and I talked with Republican and Democratic colleagues about that, and later became saddened when the omnibus voter bill, uh, voter ID bill in 2013 came about, because I didn't see the same consideration being given across the board. And I led the fight uh, on the House floor against that bill, and felt that we had followed generations in this state of cooperative ways uh, following desegregation to make sure that everyone in this state had the opportunity to fairly and fully vote, and I saw that as a retrenchment, and uh, then spent several years after that being deposed by Phil, um, uh, or cross-examined at trial. Um, um, uh, but, but the point being that it is time, uh, as Phil said, to tone down the rhetoric, to focus on consensus solutions, and to recognize this democracy exists because of us, all of us. And we ought to find common ground, whether it is voter ID, whether it is same-day registration, whether it is early vote, uh, or whether it is how we district. And there's certainly no more political function right now uh, than the issue of redistricting, made that way by the Democrats before and the Republicans now. No, nobody has a monopoly on morality uh, in this saga. Um, and, and I favored, at the end of my Democratic time, uh, redistricting commission, my last two years in, as a majority member, and I favored it as a minority rep member, and the House of Representatives, I think it was 2011, or, uh, as I recall, uh, passed, uh, bipartisanly passed, a redistricting reform proposal uh, that died in the Senate. 
there are Republican and Democratic voices. There are a hundred different ways to do it. But there are Democratic and Republican voices who've existed for years talking about it will not get the politics out of it, but it will tamp down some of the politics. And it will return some sense of a process that we are not always engaged in litigation for 10 years between cycles in an endless war that defeats public confidence in the institutions of government and ultimately, no matter how the judiciary rules, catches them in a bind where it reduces confidence in the independence of the judiciary, which itself is under attack from a number of circles these days. So the two cases that, uh, that Phil talked about, I view the Alabama case as a really serious case because it is uh, an opinion where in Alabama, 27% of Alabamians are uh, people of color. There are seven congressional districts. The Republican legislature's drawn map uh, included one majority minority district by stacking and packing um, uh, African Americans into that district. And all of the other African American votes were spread out into three other districts, making it uh, really impossible for that, um, given the racially polarized voting history in Alabama, for them to have a shot at any of the other six. That case went to a three-judge panel. Two of those federal judges were appointed by President Trump. The panel unanimously, in about a 250-page opinion, as I recall, uh, struck down the Alabama plan and found it violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And the issue that's now before the Supreme Court of uh, the United States is whether or not, because Alabama's argument essentially is, well, we followed race-neutral state criteria across the board. And that vitiated any intent that we had, and it ought to be a complete defense or an immunity to a Section 2 claim. Uh, the, the trial court didn't think that to be the case, but that's the issue before the Supreme Court. And we do need an answer to that question. And I do agree with Phil's analysis that there'll be some middle ground struck so that there's an understanding of legislators and an understanding of policymakers and populations generally about when to consider race, how much to consider race, how it applies in connection with race neutral criteria. Because if you ask me to fully explain that, and I consider myself a fairly half decent lawyer, I don't know that I could. I think it is an important case for where we proceed further. And the second case, the Harper case, I, uh, we'll be have more discussion about, but I agree is an important case, but for a different reason. Uh, 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 let me backtrack. I don't think it's as important as people are making it out to be for a different reason. And that is, I think it's a completely bad set of facts um, uh, uh, to decide the uh, independent legislature um, uh, doctrine. North Carolina in 2003 adopted a very significant statutory framework for how we were to deal with uh, court supervision and review, judicial review of redistricting. And it's very clear in our statutes and it has been in our practice as it's been in practice in most of the states for 100 years that judicial review is part of that process. So regardless of how you define legislature in the uh, clause that Phil was talking about, the legislature has spoken, and they have spoken saying the Supreme Court of North Carolina has an absolute uh, part of the process. So with that in mind, I'm gonna turn this over uh, to Judge Dever and hopefully to Professor Muller, and you have now exhausted the extent of my knowledge of those two cases. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Rick. At this time, we'll turn it over to Professor Muller. Well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here, um, you know, teaching election law. Whenever I introduce myself that way, someone usually responds, oh, well, it must be interesting time to be doing election law. Um, and it's been that way my entire career, which is <laughs> something a little bit different, something a little bit new, uh, seemingly every week. Um, of the two state, uh, of our 50 states, there are two states in the union that um, are the places I would be looking for an election meltdown or crisis in 2024. Um, Pennsylvania is one of them. Um, it is a state where it doesn't appear that the legislature uh, is uh, really interested in doing a job to help solve some of the problems that are happening statewide. Um, and the second place is North Carolina, which seems to be um, in a perpetual state of litigation. And rather than the legislature not doing its job, it seems instead that there are a lot of people who want to be legislators doing a number of jobs throughout the state. 
Um, so I, I think we can focus in particular on what's happening in this Moore versus Harper case, and we can talk about a lot of other things, but I'll just take my opening remarks to, to sort of focus on um, this doctrine at issue in Moore versus Harper. Um, so states have the power to direct the time, place, and manner of holding elections for Congress under Article I, Section 4 of the Constitution. It's the Elections Clause, but a provision of that says each state uh, you know, shall come up with these rules in the manner that the legislature thereof directs. Um, so it says the legislature is supposed to do this. And when you go through the rest of the Constitution and you see the word legislature crop up, uh, who gets to ratify constitutional amendments? Well, that's the state legislature. Uh, who gets to elect senators? Well, that's the state legislature. And there are all these places where the word legislature crops up. Um, and every time you see that, it's the legislature as an entity and as a body doing a delegated function by the Constitution of the United States. Um, so the question is, when it comes to the elections clause, what does that mean when the legislature does something? And this has been sort of a, a dispute that's cropped up in a number of cases. In 2000, there's a parallel clause in the, uh, for presidential electors. And in 2000, Chief Justice Rehnquist in Bush versus Gore wrote a separate opinion on behalf of himself and uh, Justices Scalia and Thomas to say, you know, this word legislature means something. When the Florida Supreme Court shows up and the legislature has a statute that says you shall do this, and the state Supreme Court says, well, we're going to construe that as may. We think you've deviated from the legislative scheme and usurped the legislative power. Only got three votes, didn't go very far. Uh, a few years later in Colorado, when they were doing some redistricting, um, they couldn't get to an agreement. So the court comes up with an intermediate map or an interim map. Uh, the legislature is under unified control a couple of years later, so they say, well, we're going to come up with our own map now. You know, now we've got our act together, we can come up with a map. Uh, the Colorado Supreme Court said, sorry, you don't get to do another map. Um, we're construing our state constitution, which says you do this uh, at this point in time to mean that it only happens once. It goes up the state or United States Supreme Court, and again, Chief Justice Rehnquist with Justices Scalia and Thomas write separately, say, like, there's got to be some limit. There's got to be some opportunity for the state legislature to step in here. Um, and so there are a couple of cases that have co cropped up that are recurring themes, and I'll mention two of them out of North Carolina, right? And one of them is more. But the other one, and this has happened in Minnesota and, and other states too, um, but there, there are cases where the executive enters into consent decrees with private parties and seeks judicial enforcement about them. And saying, listen, I know our ballots are supposed to come in at this point in time, but we've got some litigation, we want this to go away, so we're gonna enter into a consent decree and essentially say the ballots are gonna come in at a different time. Okay. There's all kinds of reasons why you in the room want to settle cases and turn to consent decrees, right? Um, but there is something a little bit unusual about the executive doing something when the legislature has said something else and entering into this consent decree. Now, a case from the Supreme Court this summer, also involving uh, North Carolina, said, well, you know what? If the state wants to allow the legislature or legislators to intervene in these disputes, the state can do that, an 8-1 decision by the United States Supreme Court. So I think to the extent that we're worried about state executives perhaps usurping the legislative role in these elections, we're going to see some of those cases start to dissipate. States like Georgia and others have instituted laws similarly saying, before you enter into consent decrees, you've got to let us know. Or before you enter into consent decrees, we have the right to intervene in case we disagree with the direction that the executive has done. So that's one area where we're worried about sort of usurping the legislative power. The other is the case here and more, right, where the, where the state Supreme Court, it, it's not construing a provision of the Constitution like it did in Stevenson or like it did in Dixon, where we're talking about you can't split up counties. Um, it's looking at, it's not even looking at the free and fair elections clause like the Pennsylvania Supreme Court recently did in finding anti-gerrymandering provisions. Um, it's looking at, um, shall I say, penumbra formed by emanations of, of four clauses of the state constitution to say there's an anti-gerrymandering provision. Now, again, you know, Chief Justice Markman, and, and you heard the panel before, you know, state constitutional law can look differently from justice to justice, from state to state, right? But there is something a little bit strange about that kind of construction that hadn't existed in North Carolina for, uh, for nearly 250 years, right? So, the heart of this case is to say, well, is there some boundary here and some limit? So let me offer sort of a couple of, of thoughts, and then, I'll, and then I'll sort of hand it over to see if we have some more uh, conversation. Um, the first is to emphasize the narrowness of this issue, right? Um, this case cannot does not affect state or local elections. It only applies to federal elections, which the United States Constitution covers. 
it does not allow the state legislature to do whatever it wants. In particular, it does not allow the state legislature to appoint presidential electors after the fact, after an election has been held. Um, virtually every major media outlet has made the false statement <laughs> that this is what this doctrine would allow at the end of the day. No one agrees that it would, okay? So it, it doesn't allow the legislature to show up on, in January 3rd and say, we're appointing a new slate of presidential electors. Um, it still says that all state elections are subject to constitutional oversight, the due process clause, the equal protection clause, the anderson burdick balancing test that we use. Congress still has the power to make or alter rules for elections. If you don't like what's happening in the states, have Congress change it. And it's done so a lot of times. It's, this, it's the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Uniform and Overseas Citizen Absentee Voting Act and Motor Voter and the Help America Vote Act. And, and I could have a long laundry list, right? There are all those rules that still trump what's happening in the state elections. Um, state governors can still veto bills. Now, the wrinkle in North Carolina is when y'all came up with a gubernatorial veto a few decades ago, you said, we're going to carve redistricting out. <laughs> That's the one thing the governor doesn't get to do. So there's five states that don't have this. And this case wouldn't exist, I don't think, if the governor had veto power over the redistricting maps in the state of North Carolina. Right? So there are so many situations where you think about how narrowly this case applies, the kinds of things I'm talking about where the state Supreme Court sort of does something else or where the where the there's a consent decree at issue. Those are the things that we're thinking about. Um, so finally, what might, the, what might the Supreme Court do? Um, let me offer sort of four universes very briefly. Um, the first, it says nothing. <laughs> States, you're left on your own. We're going to get out of this business. It's been doing that a lot recently, including in Rucho. Right? So that's one option. Another option at the other extreme is to say state constitutions cannot substantively bind Substantively, not procedurally. Substantively bind state legislatures when they're doing a federal function, which means Stevenson and Dixon actually might be overturned too, right? To say the state legislature can do whatever it wants. Another narrower one promulgated by some amici in the case is to say, well, there needs to be a clear statement rule. States like Florida and Ohio and New York have a really clear anti-gerrymandering provision. Everyone agrees what that anti-gerrymandering provision is. And you've got to have something like that in your constitution in order for it behind the legislature. Also way the court could go. And finally, most narrowly, the court could say as long as the, the state courts are doing what state courts typically do and not intruding on a significant federal interest, you should just leave it alone. And this gives you the sort of narrowest escape clause, and there's super wonky federal courts precedent to talk about here, but the super narrow escape clause for those cases where the state Supreme Court really just goes off the track and truly usurps the legislative function. Um, so those are some ways the court might go, and we'll wait and see how the argument plays out. Just uh, any responses or continued discussion, Phil? Yeah, a few things. I'll, um uh, I would respectfully disagree with uh, the professor about the clarity of Ohio's anti-gerrymandering. At least it was clear until the courts got a hold of it. So, um, but uh, I did want to touch on uh, House Bill 589 uh, that Rick uh, talked about because I, we actually litigated that case, um, and that case went on for a while, um, and did have the pleasure of taking Rick's deposition several times uh, that he was a wonderful witness. Um, got some good stuff out of him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. He just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> um, you know, that, that was, when you think about, when you think about uh, the election system, you know, access to voting is very important, and Rick did a lot of important work uh, when he was in the legislature trying to improve access. But the, the flip side of access, of course, is integrity and making sure that it, it's hard to cheat and that it's not that there's rules in place to make sure that only legal votes uh, are counted. And I, and I think that House Bill 589 was an effort to, to find a new balance between access and, and integrity. Uh, there'd been a lot of input or there'd been a lot of attention on access, uh, but not on integrity. Now, you can debate the merits and the demerits of that and the specific ways that they went about doing it. But when they, when they, uh, when, when it went to court uh, in the district court in Winston-Salem, 
the uh, district judge uh, wrote a, gosh, I don't know, three, four hundred page opinion. He slogged through every provision. He analyzed it up and down, and he found no violations of uh, the VRA or any other law in a very extensive analysis. And that case went up to the Fourth Circuit. And I think what the Fourth Circuit did is it's a it would be a, ver a version of the uh, – of uh, the Holy Grail uh, concept, they were like, man, this judge went through, he found there was no you know, racial effect, uh, adverse racial effect in every one of these provisions, and I don't really want to go through all 400 pages of that and have to deal with that. So I'm just going to say their intent was bad uh, because that's a lot easier. It's a lot easier for me to pull out some newspaper paper clippings, some, you know, some, uh, you know, off the cuff remarks that people made and write a much shorter opinion saying, well, they had bad intent, therefore the law is wiped out. And the, 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 the Fourth Circuit actually never challenged, didn't overturn, it did not disturb any of those 350 pages of findings of fact uh, that that law had zero adverse racial effect on, on minorities. And I think when you look at voter turnout uh, subsequent to that law, and, and there was at least one election where the, the law was in effect, photo ID turnout went up, and I'm sure uh, Rick would have some things to say about that, but the fact is turnout, turnout increased, uh, and then the legislature enacted uh, a, a modified version of that subsequent to that that had uh, a reasonable impediment provision which allowed people to vote even if they didn't have their ID and uh, just had a, you know, even a half-baked reason why they didn't have it. Um, and that was, it turned out, incre you know, increased. There was no issues with that. Uh, and so I think, I think um, that's one area of debate where it's gotten a little bit distorted and there's been more uh, emphasis on access as opposed to uh, uh, that uh, access over integrity. And I think, you know, to a point the professor made, you know, I think it's important for all these entities to stay in their lane, and that includes the legislature, no doubt. Um, but the courts have to stay in their lane. They have, you know, they're, they're to say what the law is, not what the law ought to be. The legislature gets to say what the law ought to be. And the administrative agencies are there to implement the law, not change it through, you know, written guidance or memos or, or even regulations or rules. And uh, I, I think that's been a significant source of litigation. And I think uh, if, if folks would stay in their lanes, we'd have a lot less uh, litigation. And then finally, on the a point about the, uh, the Alabama case that uh, Rick mentioned, the, the actual issue from my perspective in that case was the three-judge panel told the legislature that because it's possible for you to draw another black district, you have to do it, no matter what that district looks like and really without respect to the geographic compactness of the actual population that was at issue. Uh, and uh, the, the district judge in Louisiana did uh, had a similar ruling. And I think with this, you're gonna see the Supreme Court probably look at that and say, no, if the if a population is dispersed all over the state, just because you can find a way to, to collect them into a district doesn't mean you have to, to do that. Rick? Thank you, Judge, and, uh, and Phil, I'm gonna um, uh, agree with you on some points and disagree on others, which is kind of how we do. Um, the, the first thing is, I, I actually agree with Phil on the stay in your lane theory, um, which is why I think the case isn't as important as other folks may think it to be, because that's exactly what the North Carolina Supreme Court is doing based on the statutory authority in 2003. There was a re-articulated system of judicial review and it says that any action that challenges the validity of the law that's passed in redistricting, legislature says, shall be filed in the Superior Court of Wake County and heard and determined by a three-judge panel of the Superior Court of Wake County with appeal then to the appellate branch of the government. The legislature also was in its lane when it passed that. And it said as a protection, as a system of checks and balances which has to occur, the judiciary has a role. Now, there are states, I assume, uh, that don't have that provision. And we have a, that's where this theory, I think, gains more ground. 
But here, it can't reasonably be argued that the judicial system was doing something outside their lane when the statute passed by the legislature on how to redistrict incorporated them into that lane. And I think then once it's there, then you can't have uh, the argument that a state Supreme Court can strike down, uh, or can't strike down, uh, a, a law with regard to redistricting that violates other state constitutional principles. Just two days ago, the United States Association of Chief Justices came out with an opinion, and that represents the chief justices of the highest courts of the 50 states, uh, finding uh, fault with the uh, doctrine and indicating they oppose the doctrine um, that Phil's articulating, or not Phil's articulating, but the cases are uh, being brought to the Supreme Court on. Um, now, that's an, uh, Republican and Democratic justices. I don't know what the breakdown was, um, but it is an important concept um, that if the system is to work, everyone in the system has to have confidence of it. And it can't be that a legislature can create what may result in being, under anyone's term uh, of thought, seriously gerrymandered districts and then say um, there's no right to effectively judicially review them under state standards if the judiciary is incorporated in the review scheme. That's my first point. My second point goes to Phil's talking about the, the, the voter, uh, what people call voter suppression. And I, I don't think that's accurate. Uh, I, I, I think that there are different views about how to reach the credibility concept. My concept and the reason I opposed that bill, not because I opposed uh, voting ID generally, but because as that bill was initially crafted and passed, it eliminated many forms of ID uh, for students and for the elderly that were needed. And because I couldn't figure out how credibly we would say the fairness of elections were impacted in a, in a, in a fraudulent way by having extended voting, by having same day registration, by having early voting registration drives. And so I think that part of that bill was a serious disconnect with the philosophy that Phil articulates was behind it. And I will say that there's only been uh, one time in my life of 13 and a half years as a legislator that I ever stood in protest in the General Assembly Hall and then cried when the vote was taken and it was that night because I saw decades of work in a bipartisan fashion being um, savaged. And, and I, I, I sat down after making a speech, and here's what I said that night um, uh, for the record. The majority could have chosen a different path this evening, one both Republicans and Democrats alike chose for decades, increasing polling sites, increasing access to voter registration, reducing absentee ballot obstacles, extending times and days to vote, but the majority tonight will have none of that. So down one road, more opportunity, more access, more people voting, and down the road of this bill, less access, less opportunity, and less people voting. If you did not purport to know how folks were going to vote, which road would you prefer? And better yet, which road do you think the people of North Carolina prefer? And that was my reason for opposing it, because I think sometimes uh, we purport to know, too often I think, what groups of people are going to do. And I think times have changed about what groups of people are going to do. And the best road to democracy is to let access for everyone we can, but to educate everyone to be an intelligent and informed voter the best that we can. Thank you. Professor? Just briefly, I'll just, uh, you know, a thought on the uh, Conference of Chief Justices that filed this amicus brief. Um, so they did, they, they said, on the one hand, we hope you reject this case, throw it back, but if you're going to have it, they suggested that very narrow lane, I said, you know, maybe in certain ex egregious circumstances. But again, this is a this is departmentalism at its finest, right? Of, of course, state courts are going to say, U.S. Supreme Court, don't take power away from us. Like, I mean, it was the most sort of like banal statement of a brief you would ever have, because why would they ever want to say like, oh yeah, you know what, we're, we're on board with you taking power away from us and parceling it back to the legislature. Um, so I just think about that as sort of a pretty, uh, again, it, it's what's going to, it's, it's the fight that's happening right now. How much can the state courts be checks on the state legislature? How much can they be an independent check? And that's exactly where the ball game is right now. You know, I think that uh, just an answer, Judge Dever, and I, and I don't disagree with your point, Professor. Um, 
But I was reminded when I was taught by Rhoda Billings at Wake Forest, which was long ago, but a wonderful um, chief justice at one time and also a great constitutional law professor. And she reminded us that the Constitution has a framework. And the framework is one of majority rule, but the protection and deep protection through the Bill of Rights of minority rights. And that all three branches have a duty to play in creating the confidence that both of those things can occur. And I think the, the, what we're talking about is having the responsibility or the opportunity for the leading, we hope, jurists in our state to have a say about whether the second part is true. The, clearly the legislature passes majority rule legislation. But to protect minority rights, whether they are political or racial or whatever they may be, there has always been the responsibility of the courts as the protector of our individual freedoms, particularly minority freedoms. And I think that's really what's at play here. And the question is, as you framed it, where the balance is in the solution. But I don't think we should disagree about the role of who protects minority rights in society and who ensconces the majority rule concept. Phil? Just, yeah, just, just to touch on that briefly, um, you know, I think, I think the, the legislature does protect minority rights. Uh, it, of course, things pass by a majority, but that doesn't mean that the rights of the minority aren't taken into account, and I think that they often do, particularly when it comes to election law, and I've, 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 I've been in the room when it's happened, so I know, I know that they think about those things, and I know um, that the way it gets reported on is not the way it actually happens uh, when it happens. Um, but I and I also I agree that the courts are there to protect uh, minority rights among many other things, but they have to do it consistent with the rule of law. Uh, the, the courts, uh, I think, begin to diminish themselves and then hurt their credibility when they adopt the attitude of, uh, you know, I, I have to do this because I can, because nobody else will. Uh, and that's some of the attitudes we've seen, certainly in the cases I've, I've handled and, uh, and other cases I've read around the country, is courts that step in and say, well, no one else is going to do this, so I'm going to do it uh, because I can. And then, you know, you try to challenge me if you do. I think um, you, you, you start to cross a line with credibility, and that's when people begin to uh, lose trust, not just in the institution, but in all institutions. Uh, they begin to lose trust in elections themselves, uh, and that's why I think it's important for uh, courts, especially for for many of the reasons that Professor uh, Chief Justice Markman talked about. Uh, to to you know, if it's if it's important for any institution, particularly to stay in the lane, I think it's the courts, uh, and um, and you know, in. For instance, in North Carolina, when the courts were interpreting the uh, whole county provision, that's a very specific provision. It's pretty easy to see it. It's got to mean something. It specifically applies to redistricting. I think that's when a court is at sort of the apex of its cre credibility in terms of dealing with that. Uh, but then when a court's looking at very broad language that's been around for hundreds of years that um, and, and creates things whole cloth out of it, I think that's when they're at the, the lowest point of their credibility. And, it, and the decision has to be justified even more. And so I think um, you know, staying within the bounds of the rule of law is important. But staying within the bounds of the rules of law has a couple of components. One, when the legislature decides that there is a role for the judiciary in that state to play, then they are staying within the bounds. And the second thing I think about, because I don't disagree with, with the points uh, that you're making, Phil, but the second thing I think about is when you think about years ago, I, I remember it being the 13th congressional district, as I recall, the one that, that just snaked all the way from Greensboro into Charlotte. Twelve. Uh, well, yeah. Numbers change. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I represented three districts in 13 years. Um, but that... How does anybody have faith in the institution of the, the redistricting process when you can't conceivably articulate compactness, contiguity, communities of interest in districts that look like that, whether they are created by Democratic legislatures, as I recall that one may have been, or whether they're created by Republican legislatures? It's the public that has the right to have fair districts and fair votes, which is why, again, I think, as Phil actually talked about, there are some opportunities for reform and discussion that both Republicans and Democrats can agree. The problem is that they have to find the right time to have it. 
Um, the discussion that I tried to engender along with uh, Republican colleagues in 2009 and 10 to uh, then Speaker Hackney and President Bass Knight was, things can change. It's time to get out of this process and to put an independent reform in play at least for the next election cycle. That was an opportunity the Democrats missed. Equally, the first couple years, the Republicans were in control. When it wasn't all that clear what was going to happen in the courts, when things could be undecided, or most recently in the 2019-2020 scale, was the time when Republicans missed the opportunity. Republicans who had been so much in favor of independent redistricting when they were in the minority turned clock when they became in the majority. But that's not to oppose Republicans. The Democrats did exactly the same thing when they were in charge. The goal ought to be as people to find the right moment when we can get people to the room to say, this has, we have been in litigation for forever. Is that beneficial? When districts change, but people don't even know what districts they're voting in, we have a right and a responsibility to come together to find a different path, or at least try a different path for democratic rule. Uh, Rick, that, that was a, a good segue to a, a question that, w that we've gotten. Uh, the premise of the question being that the 2020 election was, uh, was unprecedented. What was proposed in its immediate aftermath, and this really is for all three panelists, in terms of uh, everyone can go back in time and, and remember March 2020 and concerns about COVID and how is, how is this going to affect voting and, and, and legislatures responding to that and then some administrative agency there being some litigation, the election happens. What, if anything, has transpired, um, and this is to all three, um, in, the, in the aftermath of that in various states, is there litigation go ongoing right now in connection with any of that that, that any of y'all are aware of? And, and, and you know, what do you see for 2022 uh, in terms of, of uh, of any response to whatever the, the response was to the 2020 changes? Phil? Um, so at least in North Carolina, the legislature uh, did change the rules that, that through the proper, you know, democratic process and, and passed a bill to uh, less, you know, ease restrictions on voting for uh, in light of the pandemic. Uh, and I believe that legislation then said, but this is only good for this year, basically, or this election, and then it reverted back. So, so far, uh, I'm not aware of any effort um, to change the rules uh, based on uh, the pandemic, which seems to be waning. Um, although we, 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 you know, we, we, we filed a lawsuit this afternoon while I was sitting here, actually, over some. <laughs> Rules over some technology is a wonderful thing. <laughs> exactly, uh, over some some changes the state board of elections recently made to the, through a, basically some memos that we think changed the law. So that that kind of thing is still happening, but it was not based on COVID. Right. Rick, yeah, I, I mean I agree with Phil that the 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 legislation sunset uh, and it was intended to do that. It, it tried to fix the problem and, and create better access during a moment of emergency. Um, so I'm, 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 uh, in a, I'm unaware of any other opportunities. And then, Professor, nationally, have you seen this topic coming up if, like, for this, this cycle? Not at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so there, were a lot, there was a lot of litigation specifically saying the state legislature has not been responsive to COVID concerns in 2020, which gave rise to a lot of these absentee ballot rules, a lot of the extended deadlines and things like that. None of that that I'm aware of is happening for 2022. There's no pandemic-based concerns for new litigation. Now, there was a whole bunch of legislation enacted in 2021 and 2022 in states, Georgia, Texas, Iowa. I mean, you can go across. I mean, there's, there's dozens of bills that were enacted um, addressing like a variety of concerns about absentee voting, about um, funding of elections, about deadlines and receipts, about the flexibility that local election officials have or the flexibility that state boards of elections have in defining rules. So there are a whole sort of suite of those things that are happening in the states right now. And some of those are being litigated. Um, but again, those are sort of the legislative response to some of the concerns that arose out of the 2020 election. And, and Phil, are you see, have you been seeing in, in, in your practice uh, nationally uh, any sort of more litigation associated with just the, the regulations in general? I mean, you mentioned the most recent lawsuit, but I mean, is the, is the amount of litigation um, 
uh, significantly less associated with, in terms of election administration, challenge to sort of traditional election administration legislation or regulation? I think it is. I, I'm not seeing as nearly as much as, I mean, 2020 was just explosion. Um, I'm not seeing anything like that. I think part of the reason is that COVID is waning. The other reason is it's a midterm election, not a presidential year election. And I think as a result, you're going to see a lot less voting by mail. And it was the voting by mail that really caused the most angst and the most problems. Uh, whatever you think about what the reactions were to it, that's what really touched off a lot of problems. And I don't see that happening this time. Yeah, it, like, if, uh, this is a little bit more of the policy side. You know, Rick, Rick's uh, story about the absentee ballot is, is is the true narrative of what I thought of the universe until about 30 months ago, which is, Republicans were big proponents of absentee voting and voting by mail because that was the elderly and that was military voters. And Democrats were big opponents of it because um, communities of color were distrustful of the Postal Service at higher rates, among other things. And then I wake up one morning and I said, what? What happened here? <laughs> like everyone's just like took the other position in a matter of hours. Uh, it seemed so. It's a, it's a very strange place to be. Again, part of that is exacerbated by the sheer volume of absentee balloting made processing in many places difficult and challenging, which resulted in later revealing of ballots, which were also skewed in a partisan fashion because there was also this COVID overlay of. If you were less afraid of COVID, you would go vote in person. And if you were more afraid of COVID, you would vote by mail, which created a different kind of polarization. So we have some remarkable and bizarre and hopefully one day in the near future waning <laughs> polarization over some of these uh, voting techniques. And Rick, just your, your perspective on the topic, both as a, as a lawyer still in the arena and then as a person who was a legislator on these topics. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, again, I, I, gr I think the professor's right about how things change, but that's the problem in election law. It's who's in control. Uh, the, the positions shift, uh, which is why I go back to uh, the, the, the need to be thinking about this in a, in a, in a different way. I, I do think um, that a number of the, I, I guess what I would say is we're talking about real issues with real possible solutions up here, and this audience is engaged in it. What is not helpful is things that, that Phil mentioned were not helpful, and that is um, uh, attacking people's uh, votes uh, because the votes tabulated uh, the elections board couldn't get to till three days later because of the number, and then imputing the integrity of elections workers. Elections workers are extraordinary people, and in this last election cycle were extraordinary. Um, to have elections workers have their lives threatened because someone says, that ballots that were uh, tabulated after midnight on election night have some uh, taint to the ballots that were tabulated before midnight uh, is it, just fundamentally undermines the democratic institutions. And I think we all ought to speak up as lawyers to say, look, there are real issues here, but that's not one of them. And that we ought to be protective of people who serve Republicans and Democrats and independents in the election process uh, because the the, the stability of the democracy does depend on confidence in those institutions working, and we need those people working. And you are seeing a problem in a lot of places, North Carolina being one of them, finding enough elections workers uh, to get ready for the 2022 midterms for a whole variety of reasons, this being one of them. And I think we have to uh, assuage people's fear of participating in that way. Um, and and uh, Phil, as you sort of look at between now and, and and the election this year, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of litigation. You've been you've been involved in a lot of cases across the country. I mean, do you see any particular type of, of litigation between now and and sort of election day? Um, I mean, you have Purcell, uh, obviously that that limits um, a lot of things. But um, why don't you address that? Yeah, I don't I don't see um, you've got. You've, you've got – there's some litigation going on over um, voting machines uh, and whether they can should be used, certain types of machines. I think those cases are not going to go anywhere for 2022, obviously, because it's too, too late for any state to change how they um, process ballots or, or count ballots and votes. Um, but I think, I think you will see some of that in advance of the 2024 election uh, because there's a real – um, there, there's a real debate going on out there. Uh, we're very fortunate in North Carolina. Uh, for years, we've used we've got a 
all paper ballot system. We tabulate them on tabulators. Uh, and so as a result, we get our election results relatively quickly. Um, there's, you know, exceptions here and there, but we get them relatively quickly and you don't get big uh, uh, numbers dumps, you know, at five o'clock in the morning here. And so I think uh, that, that part of that's because we do the paper ballots and we have a very efficient uh, set of staff that do that. Rick? No, I, I, I do agree. I, I find it interesting, this discussion, because the election that I won in the general election of 22 by 44 votes, 20 uh, votes the night of the election, uh, I was behind, I had 28 precincts, I was behind after 27 precincts by uh, uh, 300 votes, but the last precinct came in at or after midnight, um, at, and I won it by 324 votes. Uh, and then uh, it was, if this so whole idea of when votes count I mean, my opponent could have made a, a, a stink about that, I suppose, in, if, the, if this was now as opposed to then, but that didn't happen. We all accepted the votes. We accepted, we watched the provisionals then being counted. We watched the absentee. Um, my opponent gracefully conceded at the end of it, and I it can, it said at the end of the election night that she had every right to pursue the the process of challenging that until it was clear uh, who won. And it worked out. Um, uh, I, I'm not so sure that would have been the result um, in 2020. Professor? Um, and this is, a, this is a good kind of final question from, a, from someone in the audience. Um, the growth of the unaffiliated voter, perhaps in part because of, of the rhetoric that all the panelists have talked about. Um, what role do, do you see both in North Carolina and across the country when we talk about, you know, the, the traditional, quote, tr traditional legislative structure is, is sort of the, you have the Democrats and the Republicans, but you have this extraordinary growth in a number of states of, of unaffiliated voters. How do you see that playing out as you sort of get a crystal ball and think about uh, uh, process, legislation, litigation? Just open that to Phil, and we'll just sort of go down the panel. Um, well, it's kind of interesting, you know, doing a lot of redistricting cases and and being with legislators that are drawing maps and staff that are, you know, dealing with these situations. Um, you know, unaffiliated voters, while they're not affiliated, they tend to vote one way or another. Uh, they're actually not all that unpredictable in terms of how they're how they're gonna vote, and it depends on where they live. They live around a bunch of Republicans, they might vote Republican. If they live in the city, they probably vote Democratic. Um, and so I don't know that, that, that that's, uh, to me, that seems more of a style issue. Um, they, they, they can't stand the way Republicans talk, the way Democrats talk, so they're gonna go on their own. But at the end of the day, the issues that matter to them are, are issues that matter to Republicans and Democrats too. And I don't know, I don't know how much more differently they vote, although I would certainly lean on these two uh, panelists who have more expertise on that than me. I do know there's an effort um, to get, uh, well, it's kind of ironic, uh, the legislature at one point last decade uh, tried to put an unaffiliated voter as a member of the State Board of Elections, and the uh, court struck that down as unconstitutional. Um, and so now there's actually a lawsuit pending in federal court asking the federal court to force um, unaffiliated members to be allowed to be on the state board of elections, and I'm defending that case. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I just I find I find that to be highly uh, ironic in light of the history. Rick, you know, it certainly uh, has changed uh, campaign tactics, um, uh, and I think in a sense for the better. Um, it, it, too often, and particularly. Uh, by the reduction of swing districts. It's can change campaign tactics in swing districts because too often it, uh, people view it always as a turnout battle of your pure um, majority or your pure party vote. Um, if you have a swing district, my thought was always that I needed to win 90% uh, of the Democratic vote, but I needed to win at least 40% of the independent vote. And I spent a lot of time and resources, uh, even back then, on independent voters and created my foot game, my ground game around that. And much to the chagrin of my party caucus, um, uh, because there is a, a real need to to talk to them, and you know I, I am of the view, and have always been of the view that uh, the twenty third mailer will not do any much different than the first twenty two did. 
Um, but if you put that money into people having conversations with people, uh, it is much better spent in swing districts. And I think that will gain even more traction the more those districts switch, uh, where the unaffiliated become the, the chief source. Uh, and, and, and again, I, I am concerned that the numbers show um, what used to be in North Carolina was uh, 15, 10, 15 years ago, the top of the ticket. Um, there was a, you know, somewhere between a 20 and 25 percent variation down ballot. Um, you might have a, a Republican presidential and senatorial votes, but you might have Democratic votes for a state house or the court. Um, I think in the last election cycle, if I remember seeing it, it's somewhere around 3 percent differentiation. People are sticking to party. So again, that makes the unaffiliated voters even a more important target because I don't think that first dynamic is changing. Professor? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think if you talk to political scientists, they'll say there's no such thing as an unaffiliated voter, right? They're, uh, they're the people who are spiritual but not religious on the religious <laughs> side, right? Like they are, they have they have predilections. They just don't want to label themselves as Democrats or Republicans. Um, now, that's not to say there isn't ticket splitting, and it can be very small. I think we're going to see in Georgia some record ticket splitting for a Republican governor and a Democratic senator. We're going to see how that plays out. Right? There, there are these idiosyncratic things. Um, when you talk to someone, you say, oh, I'm an independent. Oh, who would you vote for? Well, you know, Obama, Obama, Clinton, Biden. You know, they're not, doesn't feel as independent. Oh, yeah. There, there is sort of a pretty consistent mantra about being in one, of the, one or the other. Part of it might be that, that the parties are so atrophied these days, especially at the state level, along with sort of the pernicious sniping about partisanship that many people don't want to be formally associated with them and therefore sort of peel out, but still informally very closely associate with one or the other. Um, well, I want to, uh, we're at the end of our time, and I want to thank uh, all the panelists. They're all extraordinarily busy. Uh, a very insightful uh, discussion. I, uh, Rick's comments about Judge Fox uh, reminded me really of the, a hallmark of, of uh, Federalist Society events about civility, breeding civility, having uh, a discussion, uh, a rational discussion about serious issues. Um, and this panel uh, exemplified that. I'm not going to sort of dis discharge this panel just yet because it's my privilege to actually introduce the president of the Federalist Society, who, who also, I, you know, I think the Federalist Society, there's a culture of civility, and it begins with Gene Meyer, uh, who is the president is, and has been a friend of mine for a long time, and it's, it's my privilege to, uh, to introduce uh, Gene uh, to speak to this uh, first North Carolina conference. This is gonna be incredibly brief, but I wanted to uh, thank all of you for being here. Um, I know we've got a wonderful debate coming up, uh, but this, 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 con this conference is exactly what we do try to do. And this panel was typical of what we do try to do. Uh, and I'm delighted to have so many of you so involved in the Federal Society. I hope you'll continue to be that way. But I did want to say on behalf of the national organization that, th that this conference is exactly the sort of thing we wish to do, and we thank all of you for being part of it. Thanks. <laughs>